Hello. <laughs> All right. So um, today, as you guys have probably figured out by now, uh, we're going to have class online. So this is just our online lecture that I'm sitting here doing in my office. So <laughs> you guys may have noticed that I was a little bit angry today at um, the technology. So this is kind of like my picture of myself today. I'm sorry if I was uh, <laughs> a little angry at the technology. Meh. That's pretty much what I was like. Um, so, so anyway, I was just going to apologize if I seemed a little uh, angry. See, check out this guy's got hair coming out of his nose here. Okay, so anyway, let's go on to the lecture. <clears throat> so today we are going to be talking about the products of two binomials. And, and really what we're going to be talking about is special products. Um, and so what I mean by special products is basically formulas for products you know and so yesterday we went over how to multiply a lot of polynomials together and a lot of those examples ended up really ugly uh, some of them ended up not so ugly uh, but a lot of them had kind of a certain pattern that they followed and so we're going to go over those patterns today and each of those patterns uh, has a formula or a rule behind it um, these formulas and rules these can help you out in a lot of different situations the first one we're going to go over foil. Um, that one's kind of just a basic rule on how to organize things, but when we get into other very specific formulas, uh, those are things that if you remember them in a testing situation, I mean, they could save you, you know, 50% of your time on a problem or, or even 80% of the time. I've definitely had some problems that I've given on exams where um, if you remembered there were certain, there were a special product, uh, the, you know, the, the problem almost went away. <clears throat> so it definitely helps to remember these things. Some are a little bit more important than others. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. So the first thing that we're going to consider is the FOIL method. FOIL. <clears throat> um, and the FOIL method is just, it's kind of just a way to organize your multiplications. Um, you may have noticed that this is the same method I used in class yesterday. I just didn't call it the FOIL method. This is the method where we select one term out of one of the binomials, and we multiply it by both the terms in the other binomial. And then we select the other term and do the same thing. Okay, so, so let me show you how this works. So to organize your FOIL, and this is how you should show your work on your homework, at least for now, for at least the first few problems, maybe. F-O-I-L. So F, that stands for the first terms, right? The first terms in each binomial. So that's my arc for my F multiplication. X times X is just X squared. My O, that's my outer terms. So I can multiply my first term over here with my last term in the other binomial, and that gives me my O term. So X times four gives me plus four X. All right, now I wanna multiply my inner terms for the I. So my inner terms, that's gonna be five times X, plus five X. And then finally, my last terms. By last, they mean the last two terms in each binomial, or the last term in each binomial. So we multiply these guys. All right, and so in this case, my last terms are both constants, so I get a constant out. Finally, we collect any like terms, and then we can call it a day. So I can see my middle two terms go together, 4x and 5x, so I have x squared plus 9x plus 20. And so let's just go back and notice real quick. And throughout the video, you can keep doing this, even though I don't ask you to. You can pause the video and just make sure this pattern holds. I'm gonna go back and erase my arcs here. Um, this number right here, the 20, the constant term, that is the product of these two numbers, five and four. But this number right here, the coefficient on the middle term, that is the sum of these two numbers, five and four. So the sum of the constant terms, that should end up being the coefficient on your middle term. And the product of the constant terms, that should end up being your actual last term. All right, so that was one example of FOIL. We'll see a few more, though. Here is the official um, description of FOIL. Um, since this is in an official rule box, it's okay to put this whole thing on your note card if you wanted to. Uh, by then, you should probably have this down to where you don't need it on your note card, but it's okay to do that. 
Okay, so right here they ask us to form an equivalent expression by multiplying these things together. Oh, we can do that. So what we'll notice real quick here is that there's no coefficient on these leading terms, right? And I have my, my variables in front. And so the pat a certain pattern is actually going to hold on this one. Okay, so when I get done, when I get done, um, I should have a constant term that is equal to the product of these two, right? And so I should have a constant term equal to 40. And I should have a middle term that's equal to the sum of those two. And so 8 plus 5 would be 13. So I should have 40 as a constant term and a middle term of 13. All right, and so let's foil this out and see if we're correct. So I have my F, O, I, L. My first two terms, that's just x times x squared. That gives me an x cubed. My outer terms, that's x times 5. That gives me a plus 5x. My inner terms, that's going to give me a plus 8x squared. And then I have my last terms. Those give me a plus 40 for a constant term. Okay. Oh, oh, man, I was incorrect about the middle term. I didn't think about that x squared in there. But, but the constant term I was correct about. So let, let's rearrange this and see what we get. <laughs> All right, so x cubed, right? My 8x squared comes next because I like to write these in descending order where the highest degree comes first and the lowest degree comes last. So I have plus 8x squared plus 5x plus 40. So I was not thinking that these two terms in the middle weren't going to combine because they weren't going to end up being like. Um, but if you'll notice, the constant term did end up being 40 still. And so yeah, uh, if you have a square term in the front here, the pattern still doesn't quite hold because those two, two terms in the middle aren't going to be like. And it, we want them to be like <clears throat> in order to combine them. So let's move on to this next example. So this next example really is an, a, a, a case of the, the easy example, right? Or the, the basic example. So we have no coefficients in front of our x terms, in front of our variables, and the, va the variables don't have any squares or anything. They're both just single degree. So the pattern should hold in this, right? For this guy right here, um, here, I'll just write it down below. I'll say my constant term that's going to equal 7 times 4, which is equal to 28. For my middle term, that's going to be 7 plus 4. So the middle term is going to be, sorry, I should say the coefficient. The coefficient of the middle term is going to be 7 plus 4, which is just 11. So let's go ahead and foil this guy out and make sure that we're correct on this. Okay, so I have my, my F term, my O term, my I term, and my L term. <clears throat> All right, so uh, my first two terms are the X's. That gives me an X squared. My outer terms, that's an X times a positive 4, so plus 4X. My inner terms, 7 times X. And then finally, my last terms, 7 times 4. All right, now I just combine my like terms. And that leaves me with an x squared plus 11x plus 28. OK, so we were correct about this one um, because there was no weird things going on with the variables. Right, they were just single degree. There was no coefficients. And so the pattern that we expected to hold actually held this time. So we have a 28 over here for our constant term, just like we said we were going to have. And we have a, a plus 11 on our middle term for the coefficient, just like we said we were going to have. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So for this next example, uh, notice it's once again one of these easy examples. And I put that in quotation marks because these aren't necessarily easy. They're just um, <laughs> easier than some of the other ugly ones. All right, so go ahead and pause the video real quick and do a couple of things for me. First, I want you to predict what the polynomial is going to look like, right? Predict what the middle term is going to be. Then I want you to predict what the constant term is going to be. Then I want you to foil it out 
combine like terms and see if you are correct. Okay, so I'm going to assume because you're all excellent students that the video will be paused right now and you'll all go and do that, which means that I don't have to stay, I don't have to wait for long. So I, I hope you've all just done that. Now I'm going to go ahead and foil this guy out. First of all, I'm going to identify what I think the constant term and the middle term are going to be. Uh, and, and this isn't required on the homework unless it specifically asks you to, to guess what these things will be or to predict what they'll be. I'm just doing it so that we pick up on this pattern and it becomes familiar to us. All right, so I'm going to say my constant, that is supposed to equal this term multiplied by this term. So my constant, that's going to be a negative 6. Right, the signs come along with it. And then uh, for my coefficient of my whoops, middle term, I guess I could have wrote that and paused it so you guys didn't have to sit here and watch my sloppy writing, but I'll just keep going. All right, so um, the coefficient of the middle term well, that's supposed to be the sum of these two numbers, right? And so we add those together. So I have a positive 3 plus a negative 2, which is the same thing as saying 3 minus 2. So that gives me a positive 1 for the coefficient on my middle term. And when I say middle term, let me go on a little tangent here. When I say middle term, I do mean middle term only if you arrange these in decreasing order. Right. For this example up here, obviously I could have written this in a different order. Obviously I could write the 28 out first uh, and then maybe the 11x last so it wouldn't be my middle term anymore. But what I mean by middle term is middle term if you have it written in descending order. Okay. So let's keep going. Let's go ahead and foil this beast out. Let me just erase some of this junk up here. Sorry if you're still writing all this down. All right, so let's go ahead and foil this guy out. So we have our F, O, I, L. F means first terms. So I have Y times Y. That gives me Y squared. O, that means the outermost terms in each binomial. So I have Y times negative 2. And that gives me a negative 2Y. And then my I means my innermost terms in each binomial. That gives me 3 times Y. And then finally, I have my last terms. And so I have 3 times a negative 2, which gives me a negative 6 total. So now I just combine my like terms. All this stuff is equal to y squared plus y minus 6. And we see here that we were correct. Our constant term we said was going to be a minus 6, and there it is. And the coefficient on the middle term we said was going to be a 1. And there is, in fact, a little secret 1 out here in front of the y. So we were right. <clears throat> okay, let's go down to this ugly one. Um, so what we'll notice right off the bat with this ugly guy is that we have coefficients, which means the pattern does not hold for this one in particular. What we also have is a variable, right? We have a variable in one of our binomials um, that it doesn't really fit in with the normal, um, the normal two binomials that we multiply together. Like the nice versions of binomials are stuff with a variable and then plus or minus a constant term. Then the same variable plus or minus another constant term. Right? That's kind of nice. This one here is not nice. <laughs> um, but just because it's not nice doesn't mean that FOIL won't work on it. So we're going to use FOIL anyway. So I'm just going to give myself a little bit of room here. And then we're going to FOIL this beast out. Okay. So, F, O, I, L. <clears throat> um, so, just because this is ugly and we have a bunch of different stuff doesn't mean FOIL works differently. It just means that that pattern, that really nice pattern, isn't going to quite work this time. But FOIL, FOIL still works fine. So let's FOIL this guy. All right, so the first... Multiplication is just my first two terms. I have 4t cubed times 3t squared. That's going to give me 12t to the fifth. 
right? And, and you know what? <laughs> Just since this one's kind of ugly, um, what you guys should do is maybe pause it here and, and kind of work through this one on your own and make sure that you're correct about all these ugly multiplications just because we're practicing this kind of thing right now. So anyway, let's keep on going. Um, I'll just assume you all paused it and you learned a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, <laughs> okay. so we have 4t cubed and that's going to multiply into a negative 2 because the next thing in FOIL was my outer terms. So I have negative 8 t cubed okay now I need to multiply my inner terms so that's my innermost terms on both binomials that gives me 5 times 3 for the coefficients that's 15 and then t times t squared for the variables so that gives me t cubed now we do our last multiplication and I have 5t times negative 2 that gives me negative 10t <clears throat> All right, so this definitely did not follow the pattern, um, but that's okay. We're going to combine any like terms anyway. Okay, so I only have one t to the fifth term, so I put that out front because I'm going to write this in descending order. Uh, I have two t to the third terms, 15 minus 8. That gives me 7 plus 7t cubed. Uh, and then I have a plain old t term in the back, so minus 10t. Okay, so that's that. I'm sure there is some sort of weird pattern that pops out in here. Well, there definitely is. We're going to be able to reverse engineer it later. Um, but don't worry about that too much with these ugly examples. Just go ahead and foil them and see where that takes you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm actually... <laughs> I was pretty angry when that technology didn't work, um, but now I realize that it might have been a gift because this is definitely not a lecture that I want to rush through on, uh, even, though, even though maybe I am and I just don't notice it. Um, so this is really important stuff, and so if you don't understand this stuff, make sure that you're pausing it and rewinding it and rewatching it. All right. If you completely don't understand what's going on, you should rewatch it a minimum of three times. Right? Go back and watch that little two-minute example again, because this stuff is super important for the rest of the semester. And if you fall behind in these two sections, um, or well, I guess in the in the section before this, let's just say this chapter. If you fall behind in this chapter, it's tough to catch up. So make sure that you're staying ahead here. Okay. <laughs> Right, so it's a good thing technology broke down because then I can lecture get you guys more. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's go ahead and foil this out. F O I L. All right, so my first multiplication um, is three times seven, so I have twenty-one. Right. Um, remember, just because the variable doesn't come first doesn't mean we can't foil this. Right. Um, the variable's not coming first you know, can tend to spoil different patterns that we might see or, or that we were hoping to see, but um, but just because the constant terms come first, that doesn't really matter. We just foil it out just like we would usually. So now we're going to multiply the outermost terms. I have 3 times negative 5x cubed. That gives me a negative 15x cubed. Now my innermost terms, negative 4 times 7. That gives me a ne sorry, negative 4x times 7. That gives me a negative 28x. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to do our last multiplication. And we have a negative 4 times a negative 5, which gives me a positive 20. Then I have x cubed times x, which gives me x to the fourth. Okay, so now I need to combine like terms, which there are none. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm done. I want to at least put this in descending order because that's the way that we like to organize these things and they look funky if they're not in that order. So descending order says that I have to put the highest degree term out front, which is 20x times 4, sorry, 20x to the fourth. Um, my next highest degree term is negative 15x cubed. Then comes my negative 28x and then of course plus 21. Oh, that's not 21. <laughs> How are you guys going to correct me if nobody's here to yell at me when I do stuff like that? 
Okay. So let's keep going here. Okay. So now let, let's move on to. Um, I guess let's move on to one of our. This is one of the most widely used special products that we're going to run into. Um, if you're going to memorize any special product, this would be the one because it's really easy to memorize and it pops up everywhere. And I'll just let the cat out of the bag. Um, it's my favorite personal <laughs> uh, special product, so I love using this one on exams and stuff. <clears throat> I know I need a hobby. So. Let's just go over um, what happens when we use this, right? And so just notice what form this is in, right? This says that to be in this form, you have to have a minus b times a plus b. So it basically just says that um, you just have to have the same thing in both binomials, but just with a plus and a minus differing in the middle. You just need that plus and the minus. And if you do that, it's always going to work out this way. So let me show you why the formula works. So when we foil this beast out, our first multiplication is a times a, which gives us a squared. Our outer multiplication gives us a times b, so we have plus a b. Our inner multiplication that gives us negative a b. And then finally for our last multiplication we get minus b squared. Okay so now I'm going to go ahead and collect any like terms but let's notice something real quick here. When I have two binomials that look like this that I'm multiplying together the middle two terms will always do this. They're opposites, so they cancel themselves out, right? It's the nature of that positive and the negative. They produce the same term, just opposites. So these two things actually go away. And my result is a squared minus b squared. Okay, so that's the special product. a minus b times a plus b equals a squared minus b squared. Let's go ahead and do that same thing on a real example this time. So for x plus 5, x minus 5, I'm just going to foil it out, f, o, i, l. My first multiplication, that's x squared. My outer multiplication, that is negative 5x. My inner multiplication, that one is positive 5x. And my last is 5 times negative 5, so negative 25. Okay, so let's just notice here. These two middle terms, these guys cancel out. Negative 5x plus 5x. All right, so what we have here is, whoops, that's not an x. What we have here is x squared minus 25. Okay, and if you'll notice, this is the same thing as, right, for this example, our a was equal to x and our b was equal to 5. So x squared minus 25 squared, that's the same thing as a squared minus b squared. Right? And so we got, the, we got the same thing that our special product says we should get. All right, so here is where the actual definition shows up. This is what we will call a difference of squares. <clears throat> okay, so if I ask you to multiply these things together, one thing that special products do is they allow us to um, they allow us to skip steps, sort of. Um, you know, like when you're multiplying these things together on an exam, I, I kind of want you to foil them unless you recognized that it was difference of squares. And so I'll just write our difference of squares formula over here on the side. So difference of squares says a plus b times a minus b is equal to a squared minus b squared. Okay, so we're just going to keep using that as we go along. So in this first example, my a, that would be equal to x. My b, that would be equal to 4. Since this absolutely conforms to the, the format of difference of squares, right, it has one thing plus another thing, and then that same thing minus 
that same thing. Uh, so we can just apply this, right? So this is equal to a squared, which is x squared, minus b squared, which is 4 squared. And so on my last step, I just work out that 4 squared, and that gives me x squared minus 16. Okay, we're just going to keep using the formula, right? I see that this is set up in the exact way that differences squares should be. So I say, okay, my a, that's equal to 5. My b, that is equal to 2w. So what this should equal is a squared minus b squared. Since my a is equal to 5, that's 5 squared. Since my b is equal to 2w, I have 2w squared. Now I just need to do my math. 25 um, minus 4w squared. And there we go. And you can see, I mean, that does save a little bit of time on foiling. Um, with the more ugly problems, it can save a lot of time on foiling and everything like it. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and use the same thing on this one. So for this one, yeah, I'm set up one thing, <laughs> thing A minus thing B times thing A plus thing B. My A, that would be equal to 3A to the fourth. And this, this is actually the work that I'd like you to maybe show on this first homework assignment. But then after this, you don't have to outline your A or your B. You just have to recognize the difference of squares and go for it. Okay? So my A is 3A to the fourth. And my B, that is 5. Okay. So this is equal to A squared minus B squared. My A is 3A to the fourth. So I have 3a to the fourth squared minus b squared. So that is 5 squared. So now I'm just going to square these things. 3a to the fourth squared, that is equal to 9a to the, what do you guys think? Is it multiplication or addition with these two exponents? Well, I hope you guys remember that it's definitely multiplication, right? When we take a power to another power, that's multiplication. Then we have a negative 5 squared, so that's just negative 25. <clears throat> okay. Um, so just remember, um, with a lot of these special, or well, with all of these special products especially, uh, they, they work in the reverse direction. And so just remember, right now we're looking at things that look like a plus b and a minus b, and we're turning them into a squared minus b squared. But in a little while, we're going to learn how to reverse this so that when you see a case like this with the difference of two squares, then we can factor it. We can reverse this. Okay. But for now, let's just think about the multiplication. Okay. Moving on. Squaring binomials. So um, we talk about squaring binomials. We do have a formula for that. Um, this formula can be pretty convenient. I can't say that I use it all that often. I, I tend to not recognize it when I see it, um, at least when I'm factoring. Uh, but it, it can be tremendously useful for you if you memorize it and use it. So uh, for this particular example, let's see why this is the case. So I have a plus b squared in general terms. Let's see in general terms what this equals. So this is equal to a plus b times a plus b. So then we FOIL this guy. I have my first two terms, that gives me a squared. I have my outer two terms, that gives me plus a b. I have my inner two terms, that gives me another plus AB, and then I have my two last terms, that gives me plus B squared. Okay, and so now when we combine our like terms on this guy, I end up with A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. Okay, and that's exactly what the formula tells us it is down here in our official version. Okay, uh, let's do an example though, just to make sure that that works. I mean, we know it works, but we're going to do the example anyway. 
just to show you how it works in a real life example. Okay, so now we have x plus 3 times x plus 3. We're going to multiply our first two terms. That leaves us with an x squared. Our outer terms, that gives us a plus 3x. Our innermost terms, that gives us another plus 3x. And then our last two terms, that just gives us a constant of 9. So when we put all these together, we end up with x squared plus 2 times, and I'm going to write it like this just to, just to highlight that, that it's the same pattern, 2 times a times b, right? And so it's 2 times uh, 3 times x, which is 6x, right? That's what I would get if I combine those two, plus b squared, which is 9. Right, so my a squared, that was obvious, it just turned into the x squared. 2 times ab, that worked out, 2 times 3x. And then my b squared was just 3 squared, which is 9. Okay. So I won't do the demo for this one, but there's also a negative version, right? When you have a, a uh, sorry, a negative, a difference of terms that are squared. The only thing that really changes is that the, the 2ab in the middle turns into a negative instead of a positive, okay? So suppose we're asked to write equivalent expressions to these. <clears throat> well, since I'm a good student, I have, my, um, I have my, my perfect square formula written out on the side. I'll just write it down here. So if we have a plus b squared, it is equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Okay, and that's going to allow me to uh, skip a few steps along the way. So with this first one, x plus 7 squared, I could write this out and foil it if I wanted to, um, but I sort of want to do something a little bit different. So I'm going to use this formula on it. So my capital A, that's just equal to x. My capital B, in this case, that's just equal to 7. So this should equal a squared plus 2 times a times b plus b squared. If my a is equal to x, then I have x squared here plus 2 times a times b, 7 times x, plus b squared, 7 squared. Now I just do a little bit of simplification here, x squared plus 14x plus 49, and we are done. Okay, so I didn't really have to foil that out at all. I just had to fill in the formula. Um, and this is, you know, I'd, I'd like to see some sort of intermediate steps like this on the homework, at least for this chapter. But after this chapter, if you recognize the perfect square, um, you can just use it. It's all good. Okay, let's keep going. So in this example, and remember, as I go down these, I mean, I, I'm going to do three or four of these. You should pause it and try these out on your own. So for this next one, uh, maybe not for this next one, but the one below it. This next one's a little bit weird because we have decimal points. So if you're, feeling, uh, <laughs> if you're feeling froggy, go ahead and pause it and try this one out. If not, just, just watch what goes on. So we have a capital A that is equal to 3A. And then we have a capital B that is equal to 0 0.4. Okay, so this is in the perfect square format, right? It's a binomial squared, so I can use this formula. The formula says this equals a squared plus 2 times a times b plus b squared. All right, so I have my a squared, so I'm going to say 3a in parentheses squared plus 2 times AB, so I have 2 times A, which is 3A times B, which is 0 0.4 plus B squared. 0 0.4 squared, I think, is 0 0.16. Be sure to check me on that and yell at me on Tuesday if I'm incorrect. Okay, and then um, I'm going to have to find my calculator, of course.
Okay. So this first term, the first term turns into 9a squared. The second term, 2, we have 2 times 3 times 0.4. That's going to give us 2.4a. And then the last term stays as a 0 0.16. And so this would be our solution right here. Okay. So on this next one, you guys should definitely pause this and try and use the formula, but, but be careful because we have a negative sign here, which means we're using the other formula, but the only thing that changes is that one negative sign. So use this one instead, a minus b now, a minus b squared. That one is equal to a squared minus 2ab plus b squared, okay? So this is the one that you will use for the current example. So go ahead and pause it and try and see if you can use that, right? We got to get used to using these formulas. In the future, when you're not in math class anymore, that's typically when algebra comes up later on in life. <clears throat> You'll end up getting formulas for weird things. You know, electricians, welders, um, definitely nurses. I've seen the nurses' formulas. They all use different formulas. And if you're not used to uh, looking at a bunch of letters or variables and saying, well, I think I just need to plug some stuff in and calculate. If you can't, if you're not used to doing that, it's going to hold you back in a lot of areas. So using these formulas is definitely a good thing. Life is full of formulas. <clears throat> okay. So, now that I've finished blabbing about that, let's go ahead and do this problem. I'm assuming that you've all paused it and done it on your own and gotten it perfectly correct. So I'm just going to confirm your answers right now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I just recognize, um, I'll write it up here, my capital A in this case, that's equal to T. My capital B, that is equal to 5. All right, so this should equal A squared minus 2AB plus plus b squared all right so if my a was equal to t i just have t squared minus two times a times b so i have five times t plus b squared five squared now i just do my math t squared minus 10t plus 25. Okay, um, oh, something that I, I sort of haven't mentioned here with these perfect um, with these perfect binomials, perfect square binomials, um, is that, that that little pattern that, that was working with really nice multiplication still actually holds here. Um, because if we write this guy out, it's just t minus 5 times t minus 5. Um, and... If we do that, we can see that it's one of those nice examples where there's no coefficients in front of the variables. Uh, there's no variables back here by the constant terms. It's just one of those nice, easy types of problems. And so what we can notice here, I'll write it out. I'll have to erase this though. Um, what we notice here is that if we write this guy out, the pattern still holds that we saw before. So t minus five times t minus five So the constant term here is still the product of these two constant terms up here. And the coefficient of the middle term down here is still the sum of these two terms up here. So that pattern still holds even when we're in kind of the, the perfect square territory, okay? So as we move on here, um, we'll just notice that these things are going to get a little bit, or at least this one gets a little bit uglier, but that doesn't really change what we're doing here. We still use the same exact formula. We just replace our capital A with all of 5x and our capital B with all of 3x to the fourth. So I notice this is a perfect binomial. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I'm going to use this lower formula because I have a subtraction sign in between my two terms. So I'm just going to recognize that my capital A, that must equal 5x. And my capital B, that one must equal 3x to the fourth. Okay, so now I just write my formula out and then fill it in. 
So this should equal a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. So I just fill this in directly, right? It's kind of like a plug and play at this point. I'm just going to enter everything in that I have for my variables, right? So if a equals 5x, I have 5x in parentheses squared minus 2 times a times b. So I'm going to put a in here, 5x. I'm going to put b in here, 3x to the fourth plus b squared, 3x to the fourth in parentheses squared. Now I just do my math as always. So I square the entire thing, 5x squared, which means I square both factors here, the 5 and the x. So I have 25x squared. Uh, with this middle term, I have a negative 2 times a 5 times a 3. That's going to give me a negative 30. And then I have, how many copies of x do I have here? I have an x here, and I have an x to the fourth here. When I combine those, I get an x to the fifth. <clears throat> All right, and with this last term, I just square both factors. So I square 3 to give me 9, and then I square x to the fourth to give me x to the eighth. And now I just want to, oops, this is not written in descending order. That bothers me. So I'm going to write it in descending order before I call it a day here. So 9x to the eighth. And then I have minus 30x to the fifth and plus 25x squared. <clears throat> All right. There we go. Cha-ching. Okay. So moving on, moving on. Ha, <laughs> super common mistake. Um, <clears throat> you know, like your, your intuitive brain wants you to do this almost. Because when we do have like A times B squared, this is exactly what we do, right? We attach the square to the A and to the B. But this plus sign in the middle ruins everything. <laughs> it doesn't ruin it. It just makes it more difficult. It makes it so that we have to foil things out rather than just, whoops, I should have attached two up here. It makes it so we have to foil things out rather than just applying the square, right? And so this is a no-no. Do not do this, <laughs> right? You got to foil those things out, okay? All right. So that is all of the special products chapter. Um, <clears throat> let's go into something a bit more tedious than that. And before we leave it completely, I'll say um, 4.6 is definitely the most important thing that we're going to go over today. Um, multivariate stuff, that's also confusing and weird, but you know it's easier to pick up after a while than special products are. So I would highly recommend you do some extra examples with special products um, if you're sort of uncomfortable with these at all. Okay. So <clears throat> first of all, um, let's talk about what we're doing in this section. So in previous sections, a lot of the time we've dealt with single variables in our expressions. In this section, we're going to talk about how to deal with dual variables when it comes to, you know, multiplying things, evaluating things, all that. The first thing we're going to do is I'm just going to give you an example on how to evaluate a polynomial with multiple variables. And I think we, we may have already done this before just with simpler polynomials. So basically when they ask you to evaluate for a multivariate polynomial, you just plug and play again, right? Make sure you're plugging in the correct thing for the correct variable and then calculate it all. When it's really ugly like this, I always recommend that you calculate it twice without looking at your scratch work from the other problem just to make sure that you have it correct. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and start filling in for my x's and y's. So my 4 drops straight down, right, because there's no variable there. I have plus 3 times x. x was equal to negative 2. Plus x, which was negative 2, times y squared. So that's 5 squared, because y was equal to 5. Plus 8 times x cubed. So I have negative 2 cubed times y cubed, 5 cubed. 
Yeah, it wasn't as bad as I thought. So now let's go ahead and uh, what I we just do order of operations on this, right? We're supposed to take care of all of our exponents first, then we go through and take care of our multiplication, uh, then finally we go through and do all of our addition and subtraction. So the four drops straight down, plus three times negative two. I, I can actually do that multiplication right now because it doesn't really affect the others. So minus 6 for that 3 times 2 um, and then right here I have plus a let's just I guess we'll leave the negative 2 there for now negative 2 times 5 squared 5 squared is equal to 25 plus 8 times negative 2 cubed which is negative 8 and then I have 5 cubed which is 125 all right, step by step. Next, uh, I'm going to have to figure out these multiplications before I add everything together. So um, I can go ahead and add what I have at least. So I have 4 minus 6, that gives me a negative 2. And that is plus negative 2 times 25. That gives me a negative 50. And then I have ugh, negative 8 times all this junk. I'm going to put this in my calculator for sure. So I have 8 times 8 times 125. Holy cow. Um, so that gives me 8,000. I notice I have a negative sign in here, so it's got to be a negative 8,000. All right, and so all these are negative. I'm just going to subtract them all, so that gives me a negative 8,052. All right, so that is plugging and playing with multiple variables, right? You just got to make sure that you keep track of everything and use your order of operations, and that's going to really help you out in the long run. <clears throat> Let's try another one of these. So for this guy, they say the surface area of a right cylinder is given by this particular polynomial. They say, evaluate F. Oh, sorry, it says evaluate 4H. <laughs> I thought it said, you guys, you'll laugh at this. I was about to read this. Evaluate F or H. <laughs> That's clearly not what we want to do. Evaluate 4, H equals 4.7 inches, and R equals 1.2 inches. Okay, we could do that. So, they say, this is... 2 times pi times r, we know that r equals 1.2, so I'm going to plug that in, times h, which is equal to 4.7. We're adding that with 2 pi times r squared, and our r is just 1.2. Alright, so when I punch this first term into the calculator, I have 2 times 1.2 times 4.7. So that gives me 11.28 pi. The second term, 1.2 squared times 2. That gives me a 2.88 times pi. Okay, and so now, these are, um, <laughs> oddly enough, when you have a pi back here, an irrational number like that, in a way, you can sort of treat it like a variable. Um, and so these are sort of like, these are kind of like terms. This is saying 11.28 pies plus 2.88 pies. Oh, I'm getting hungry. Um, you know, those are the same things. So you can just add those together. So 2.88 plus 11.28. And that gives us a wonderful 14.16 pi. You can absolutely leave it in that form if you want to. Uh, some of you guys might like to calculate everything out, and that's totally fine. So I would multiply that by the pi that I have on my calculator here. If you don't have pi in your calculator, multiply it by 3.14. So this is roughly equal to 44.14. Four, eight. So we would say, and it's inches, 
squared. We would say that the surface area of this particular right cylinder is 44.48 square inches. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So um, let's just remember real quick what we mean by like term. So when we talk about like terms, we mean terms with the exact same variable factors. That means the same number of x's and the same number of y's and all of that. So if we are asked to combine like terms, then we need to figure all that out. Before we do a problem, though, where we combine like terms, we're going to talk about the degree of each term with these mixed variables. So before, we said the degree of each term is determined by the number of variables in that term, the number of variable factors. Right? And so all we need to do to count up the degree of each term in here is to count up how many factors of variables are contained in them. So for this first term, we have the degree of 9x squared y cubed. Right? That is equal to 2, because I have two factors of x, plus 3, because I have three factors of y. So that's equal to 5. All right, let's try the next term. So I have the degree of negative 14xy squared z cubed. All I need to do is count all these up. So I have three factors of z, two factors of y, and I have one factor of x. So three plus two plus one, the degree of this monomial, or this term, is equal to six. Let's keep going with this. So the degree of the next term, the degree of just plain old x, y, right? I have a factor of x and I have a factor of y. So that's one plus one. So this is a degree of two. Moving on, so let's do four y. The degree of four y, you guys have probably already figured this one out, is just one, because I only have one variable factor. The degree of the next term, 5x squared, that is equal to 2, because this has two variable factors. And finally, the degree of the constant term 7, remember that just equals 0, because it doesn't have any variable factors. All right, so that's the degree of each term. Now, they also wanted us to, to uh, identify what the degree of the entire polynomial was. Um, so the degree of the entire polynomial is simply the degree of the highest, sorry, the, the degree of the highest degree term in the polynomial. In other words, the degree of the leading term. <clears throat> Since this is the highest degree, our whole polynomial is degree six. <laughs> so I'm just going to, instead of writing the whole polynomial out again, I'm just going to write it up here. So the degree of this huge polynomial, this is equal to six because that's the degree of the highest degree term in that polynomial. <clears throat> okay. So now it's, whoops. <laughs> I'm gonna pause it and erase all that. So now finally we're gonna combine some like terms. <clears throat> so the first thing I always like to do is look for the highest degree term. Um, <laughs> Except for the problem is these are all the same degree terms. So I'm going to choose the first term, and then I'm just going to look for any like terms. So I'm going to choose this term. The second term, 3xy squared, that's not like, because there's two factor of x in the term that I highlighted, but there's only one factor of x in the second term here, 3xy squared. This one here, though, this has the same number of x's and the same number of y's. And so we can call that like terms with the 9x squared y. So I just add their coefficients. 9 minus 5, that gives me 4x squared y. Then I have these two terms, which are also like 3xy squared minus just xy squared. That leaves me with plus 2xy squared. OK, so let's try this again. And maybe you guys should pause it real quick and try and do this one on your own. All right, so go ahead and pause it and collect your like terms for this big, uh, this big polynomial here and then see if we're all correct in the end. 
All right, so I assume you guys paused it. Let's go ahead and attack this thing. <clears throat> so I see I have a few third degree terms in here. I'm going to start out with the simplest third degree first, which is just a cubed. Looks like I have two of those. I'm going to go ahead and combine them and put them out front. 6 minus 11, that gives me a negative 5a cubed. Cross those out. All right, my next term I'm going to focus in on is this one with a single a factor and two b factors. Looks like I have two of those, so I'm going to combine them. 3 minus 5, that gives me a negative 2ab squared. Now I have my plain AB terms, 7 plus 9, that gives me a 16. I have only a single B term, so plus B, and only a single constant, minus 1. And there we go. All done. Since the... Um, <clears throat> Since the, I guess the leading term, there, there could have been two different leading terms here. We could have put either of these ones in front. But the entire thing is a degree 3, since that's still the highest degree term in the polynomial. All right. Ugh. <laughs> I thought I erased this problem, but I didn't. So, um, so we're just going to do it. <clears throat> So uh, here we go, subtraction of a massive polynomial. Um, basically, I take a look at this thing, and I would start combining like terms right away, except for I have this negative sign out in front of two parentheses, which I'm not allowed to just combine terms over. So I have to distribute that negative sign in before I can combine like terms. So I go ahead and I just write out my first polynomial, 4x squared y plus x cubed y squared plus 3x squared y cubed plus 6y. And now I start distributing my negative. So now I have a negative 4x squared y. This turns into a positive 6x cubed y squared. This one turns into a negative x squared y squared. And then finally, my negative 5y turns into a positive 5y. Oh boy, this is ugly. So I'm going to look for something to choose as my leading term. Um, I have some fifth degree terms, so I'm going to choose one of those. How about the one with the three factors of x? We'll use that first. Okay, so I have these two terms. They're fifth degree. They have the same variable factors. So I have 6 plus 1, that gives me 7x cubed y squared. And then I cross that out. Next, we're going to do the two factors of x and the three factors of y. Um, no bummer. Now that I'm looking at that, I can see that there's only one of those terms. So it just drops straight down. Okay, so plus 3x squared y cubed. Cross it out. Now let's move on to the next one. Um, I have some third degree terms here. Oh, I have a fourth degree term, so I have to use that next. I only have one of them. So I have minus x squared y squared. That one goes away. Finally, I hit my third degree terms. Two factors of x and one factor of y. I have 4 minus 4. That's convenient. Those guys just cancel out. Now the last ones are just my plain y terms. I have 6y plus 5y. That gives me plus 11y. <clears throat> okay. So, now let's do some multiplication. Yay. Okay. <clears throat> So for this first one, um, we are, let's see now, is there any special product to use? Not really. These are pretty terrible. Um, so we're just going to go about multiplying each term in one of these polynomials by each term in the other. Okay. So first thing I'm going to choose is this first term over here, this 3x squared y. 
I'm going to multiply it into the first term of the other binomial. So that leaves me with 3x, now x is cubed because I had an x squared times a plain old x, and y is now squared because I had plain y times plain y. Next, 3x squared y times 2y. That gives me a plus 6x squared y squared. If you're not sure what's happening in these multiplications, make sure you pause it and confirm that these are valid. Right? The, you know, we're starting to multiply a lot of stuff together at once, and you're probably going to need a little bit of practice before you're completely comfortable with it. Um, but, but you should be at least confident enough to do it slowly right now. So if you're not, make sure you go back and, and confirm what I'm doing here. <clears throat> um, <laughs> okay, so now I've handled my 3x squared y. So now I'm going to change colors here, and I'm going to attack this negative 2xy in the middle. So I multiply this by the first term in the binomial. That gives me a negative 2x squared y squared. Then I have negative 2 times plus 2y. That gives me a negative 4xy squared. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not screwing this up as I do it. <clears throat> okay, so now finally in green, I'm going to do the last term here. So I have 3y multiplied into xy. That gives me a plus 3xy squared. And then I have 3y times 2y. That gives me a plus 6y squared. Now I go through and combine like terms. <clears throat> Yay, yay, yay. Um, there's only one fifth degree term, it appears. Yeah, so this three, this one in front drops straight down. So I have 3x cubed y squared. Okay, now let's talk about the fourth degree terms. Looks like I have two of those. I have 6x squared y squared minus 2x squared y squared. That leaves me with plus 4x squared y squared. Okay, boom, boom, boom. And now I have just my third degree terms left, minus 4xy squared plus 3xy squared. That leaves me with a negative xy squared. Finally, I have my plus 6y squared. There are no like terms with that, so I just add it in the end. And I'm done. There it is in all its glory. <clears throat> so that, that's not really too bad. You know, the, the hardest part about that is just not messing up those small multiplications. You know, when I start multiplying this big 3x squared y into stuff with multiple variables, it's easy to mess up those multiplications. Um, so just be cautious when you do this. Be, be sort of slow and methodical, okay? <clears throat> so in this next portion, we're going to do some special products. And we'll just notice that just because we're using multiple variables, that doesn't mean that the special products go out the window. They're still valid, right? The special product doesn't say anything about, um, it doesn't say much about variables at all. The special products just use capital A and capital B, which stand for full expressions if we want them to. Okay, <clears throat> so this one, this first one, we're just going to foil it out. Right? There's nothing special about, nothing too special about this, uh, except for it's just two binomials multiplied together. So we use FOIL, F-O-I-L. My first two terms, P times 2P, that gives me 2P squared. My outer terms, P times negative 3W, that gives me negative 3, whoops, whoops, not negative 33, but negative 3pw. My inner terms, that gives me a plus 10pw. And then on my last multiplication, that ends up giving me negative 15w squared. So when I put everything together, I get 2p squared plus 7pw minus 15w squared. Okay, so I just use FOIL on that. <clears throat> Um, right here, we have a good example of a squared binomial. Remember the formula for this says a plus b, <laughs> sorry, that doesn't look like a plus sign, a plus b squared is equal to a squared plus
plus 2ab plus b squared. Okay, so for this example, my capital A is equal to 3x. My capital B is equal to 2y. So I'll write out my formula real quick and just fill it in. So a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So this is equal to a squared, so I have 3x in parentheses squared plus 2 times a, which is 3x, times b. Whoops. I was supposed to replace b. And b is 2y. In the end, I'm adding that to b squared, so I have 2y squared. Okay. So now I just need to do the math on this stuff. So I go ahead and square both terms, both factors of this first term. That leaves me with 9x squared. In this middle multiplication, I have 2 times 3 times 2. That gives me 12xy. And my last term is just 4y squared. So for our last two examples, um, we're just going to go over a couple really ugly versions of difference of squares. So this first one, just remember our difference of squares formula looks like this. A plus B, A minus B equals A squared minus B squared. All right, so what we can uh, just sort of notice in this example down here is that, yeah, we do have two plus signs right here, but in front of the other terms, we have a positive here and a negative here. So we can actually rearrange these into a difference of squares setup. So if we just rewrite things as 5t now minus 2x, oops, 2x cubed y squared, and then in this last one, I have 5t plus 2x cubed y squared. Okay, now I can just use the difference of squares formula. So this just says this should equal a squared minus b squared. Well, a, in this case, since I rearranged, a was just equal to 5t. So I have 5t squared in parentheses and b is just equal to that other ugly term. So I write out my parentheses and I plug it in. 2x cubed y squared, squared. Now I do the math. 5t squared equals 25t squared. 2x cubed y squared, squared, <laughs> that's equal to, right? I just apply this square to each factor. So two squared is four, x cubed squared, is x to the sixth, and x squared, or sorry, y squared squared is just, <laughs> I'm glad this lecture is almost over, is just y to the fourth. <laughs> okay. <sighs> you guys should be lucky I didn't do this in the classroom today. This one definitely would have run long. <laughs> okay, so now let's move on to our final example of the day. Okay. So this one is also a difference of squares. We just have to recognize that this one, one of our terms is an actual sum in this example, right? And so difference of squares says a plus b, a minus b, that's equal to a squared minus b squared. Well, in this case, our a can even, it can be a sum, right? We don't have a whole lot of restrictions on our a and our b. So we'll say capital A equals 2x plus 3. And then we'll say capital B is equal to just 2y. Now we fill this in. So this is equal to a squared minus b squared. a was equal to 2x plus 3. So I have 2x plus 3 quantity squared. B is just equal to 2y, so I square that as well. Okay, <clears throat> now, you know, like, <laughs> you might not be happy about this, but this particular problem, I have to foil this out now, or, or square it out using whatever means I'd like to, right? Um, maybe I'll just do that on the side. 
Okay, this is a perfect square, and it does say perfect squares a plus b squared, that should be equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So I'm going to run this particular term through that. So I have 2x plus 3 squared. My a is equal to 2x. My b is equal to 3. So I have 2x in parentheses squared plus 2 times a, which is 2x, times b, which is 3, plus b squared, which is 9. Now when I do the math, I end up with 4x squared plus 12x plus 9. Okay, so now I have to go back and plug this in to the original problem I was working on. All right, so this stuff here, 2x plus 3, this is equal to 4x squared plus 12x plus 9. And that's still minus 2y squared, which is 4y squared. Okay, now I want to combine any like terms that I might have, or at least rearrange this so that it's sort of in descending order. When they're multivariate like this, it doesn't matter nearly as much. Um, just because I'm a weirdo, I'll rearrange this to where my second degree terms are both out front. I don't think this is required, though, as long as you have one of them. Okay, and so that would be it. That would be the end of the line for that example. <clears throat> so, just remember with all these uh, difference of squares and perfect squares and all that kind of stuff, all of these operations are definitely reversible, and we're going to learn to reverse them soon. Um, but for now, it really helps to know uh, how to multiply them out first. The more familiar you are with this multiplication step, the more familiar you're going to be with the factoring later on. So make sure that you, uh, you know, study hard. That's going to be important. You're going to want to do that. Okay, thank you for your patience and have a nice weekend, guys.